Hi folks, this is Abel James, and thanks so much for joining us on Fat Burning Man, where we talk about real food and real results. Today, we're joined by my good buddy, Dr. Pedram Shojai, the urban monk. You're going to learn how to improve your health, happiness, and well-being using the ancient wisdom of the East. If you've ever struggled with adrenal burnout, stress, sleep, and other lifestyle factors, make sure to tune into this show. But first, here's some very big news. The Wild Diet is now officially a New York Times bestseller. Thank you so much for the support, reviews, and spreading the word about real food. After being out of stock for about a month when the ABC show aired, it's finally back in Amazon and in bookstores, so please check it out. And the paperback version costs even less than the hardcover. Usually it's around 10 bucks. So grab one for yourself or your friends and family. I, I really appreciate the support. And uh, the good news is that butter and bacon are definitely going mainstream. Here's what Melissa just said on Instagram. Thus far, I'm down nine pounds in only four days, and I'm eating real food. The recipes are great, and the book was not only entertaining, but also informative. As a former boxer, I was used to cutting weight, but this time I'm doing it the healthy way. Thanks, Fat Burning Man. Thank you for reading, Melissa, and congratulations. So I know a lot of you guys have been getting copies of the book for friends and family, and I can't wait to hear about how much you like eating and living wild. So let me know how you're doing. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and more. Just search for Abel James or Fat Burning Man on your favorite social network, and you should see my ugly mug pop right up. In fact, I might be time traveling and tweeting right now as you're listening to this. The internet is awesome. In other news, I'll be speaking at South by Southwest in Paleo FX in Austin, Texas, as well as a few colleges and corporate gigs this year. So if you're around town, please come by and say hi. There's even a rumor going around that Allison and I might even bake you some chocolate cookies if you come see me speak at South by Southwest. We're also going to throw a huge party for The Wild Diet being a New York Times bestseller. So if you're in Austin, Texas, please come hang out. I'd love to see you and meet you in person. Now, before we get to the show, I'd like to let you know about something new we just created for you. You might know that my wife, dog, and I have been traveling around North America and living in the boonies out of state and national parks for the past two years. Wherever you are, I can tell you firsthand, getting the highest quality real food can be a challenge, especially if you don't want to break the bank. And it's always our number one priority when we roll into town, no matter where we are, that's what we're looking for, the best food we can possibly get and a lot of times we're on a budget so we want to make sure that we're getting great food for less and so lately I've been getting a lot of questions like these Abel how do I feed my family without going broke or I'm on a budget where do I find the best real food for the least amount of money how can I save time shopping for food it seems like it takes forever so we just created a handy dandy guide to help you save time and money on your grocery bill so you can get real food for less in fact we saved more than three hundred dollars on our grocery bill last month. In this guide, you'll learn money-saving shopping hacks that will cut your grocery budget by 30%, 50%, or even more while enjoying the best quality meats, seafood, and fresh organic produce, kitchen tricks to stretch your shopping dollar further than you ever thought possible, how to save time by knowing exactly where, when, and how to shop for your favorite foods, snacks, and treats, which brands of supplements, protein, and ingredients my wife and I trust, recommend, and use at home, and much more. And since we just launched the shopping guide, you can grab it for a discount for less than 10 bucks. All you have to do is type in fatburningman.com slash shopping. fatburningman.com slash shopping. The time-saving, money-saving guide will more than pay for itself on your first grocery bill. That's the idea anyway. So if it doesn't, you get all your money back. One of our readers, Tom says, your tricks for finding cheap meat and then how to make the most of it in the kitchen are priceless. For once, I'm actually excited to go to the supermarket to hunt for healthy bargains. So throw your food budget a bone and come check out this guide today. It's at fatburningman.com slash shopping. All right, on to the show with my good buddy, Dr. Pedram Shojai. On this show, you'll learn how to reverse adrenal burnout, why Pedram gained and how he lost 15 pounds of flab, why you don't need to give up pumpkin pie if you want to be healthy, how to use ancient wisdom to keep up with the unique demands of the modern world, and much more. All right, let's go hang out with Pedram. All right, folks, I am very happy to be here this week with my good friend, Pedram Shojai. He's the founder of Well.org, producer of the movies Vitality and Origins, and the host of The Health Bridge and The Urban Monk Podcasts. He's also an acclaimed Qigong master, master herbalist, and doctor of, Orient and doctor of oriental medicine. 
Speaking from experience, I'm pretty sure Pedram's favorite food is pumpkin pie. How's it going, man? <laughs> Specifically the pumpkin pie recipe that you shared with me, my friend. Because it's the best <laughs> pumpkin pie in the world. It really been, is. Been it's, working on that for years, man. You know, what's funny is, you know, that was always my comfort food. Like I could, I could destroy a pumpkin pie any time of the day, any time of the year. And, you know, it gets to the point where like, okay, dairy sucks, gluten sucks. You know, they put too much sugar in it. It's like you can't enjoy the things that you love. And then you actually helped me hack that and be like, dude, well, we could just replace ingredients and make pumpkin pie awesome again. And, um, yeah, I got to thank you for that. It's been great. Of course. Well, I hope that's one of the things that people take away from all of this is that, you know, a lot of times when you get into, oh, I'm going to be healthy, so I can't eat grains, sugar, dairy, nuts, nightshades, anything, you know, all of a sudden all these foods are subtracted, you can't eat anything, and then you crash out because it's terrible and you feel like you're not living anymore. And there's there's always a way for you to make your food into medicine, I think, even if it's soul food medicine, right? It's and it. so, like, it breaks my heart to think that you wouldn't be able to eat pumpkin pie because you can't eat wheat or chicken eggs or something like that so yeah it's it's so much fun to to get closer to your food because all of a sudden you realize you can make whatever you want yeah well and you know i have the same thing with my my older kid right now is you know i could he you know he's almost two years old he's a monkey right he's just running around breaking things and so i could either run around saying no to everything and making his world really kind of restricted and have bumpers around everything mm -hmm. and create a world where he's constantly being suppressed or i could just judo flip that energy and be like hey buddy why don't we do this and just yeah. just boom let's go and and channel his enthusiasm into something awesome and so I think that uh, there's a lot of parallels there, and I, you know, and I see it every day because you know I got this little consciousness that that I'm responsible for. <laughs> right now, um, before we get too ahead of ourselves or have too much fun, let's talk a little bit of, about what you do, who you are, because you're a man of many talents. You've done many things, but uh, one of the most important ones is that you've been a practitioner of health for a very long time and in different ways. Uh, and and we can talk a little bit later on in the interview about how. Um, even if you know something, you can't always put it into action and sometimes you, you fall, but you always know how to turn those knobs and even fix, fix yourself in some cases. So give people just a, a brief back, background about who the urban monk Pedram Shojai is. <laughs> so I was uh, pre-med at UCLA. And um, I started interning with some pretty heavy, heavy duty docs and looked down the barrel of living their lives and was like, man, you're a miserable dude. Yeah. And so, you know, here I am walking hospital corridors wondering where all the life is. And then simultaneously, I'm taking a couple of Tai Chi classes um, and, and feeling the life coursing through my, my pores. Right. And I'm just sitting there thinking, wait a minute, here I am in the halls of healthcare. I'm seeing nothing but sickness and kind of despondent people. And, you know, I go into the park and start doing some Tai Chi and I could actually feel health. I could mm. actually transfer health through mm -hmm. my palms. And so I was done. You know, I couldn't I couldn't stay on that wagon. I really transitioned into becoming um, uh, a practitioner of these things. I found a Taoist abbot, a Kung Fu master. And before I knew it, I was I was a Taoist monk. And I had transitioned. I started becoming a doctor of oriental medicine, took off, started uh, walking the earth, uh, was in the high Himalayas when I realized um, I needed to be back here in the world mm -hmm. and that, um, I, you know, I got to say, Abel, I, I felt kind of decadent being up there because it's really easy to be amongst a bunch of people that are like praying for world peace and feel peaceful. Sure. You know, try getting back into L.A. traffic, right? Try, try getting <laughs> yeah. back into real life. Right. And holding it down, and and I was told by one of the guys up there, they're like, you, you don't belong here. You're you're a regular dude. You speak good English. Get out of here, right? Mm -hmm. And so I came back and started trying to help people, and the birth of the urban monk was really in my um, folly, right? In trying to get busy Los Angeles uh, urban working people to try to do all the like mystical stuff that I did that helped me, mm -hmm. and guess what? You don't have an hour and a half for yoga and then two hours to meditate and then jump in a salt bath. No one has time for that crap, right? Mm -hmm. It's a decadent lifestyle in, in a way because an ascetic renounces the world. But if right. you have cell phone bill, you got a car payment, you got anything that holds you to you know real life down here, you don't have that kind of time. So then how do I translate the wonderful stuff that I learned into the busy life of someone who can use it 
but can't afford to leave, can't change their name and take on a new Chinese name and get a weird tattoo and, Mm -hmm. you know, just is going to, is going to stay who they are, but can use my help. And that became, you know, last 20 years of my life, uh, really bringing the the mountain down to the cities. And it's been a lot of fun, I got to say. Yeah. And one of the cool things about your new book is that you, you approach people with their unique stories from so many different angles, right? Like they, they walk into your office and it's always a different person, but they're kind of suffering from the same thing. What is it in modern society that we are, all, what's at the root of our problems from a health perspective? Sure. Um, you know, to me, a lot of it is compression of time mm-hmm. is being caught in a, a velocity that we can't sustain with our consciousness and getting, it's just like tumbling down the white water of life and not being able to be mindful throughout the day, thinking that we're going to take some sort of break, whether it's Friday or during that vacation or retirement to like catch our breath. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we've fundamentally been doing this wrong. I think meditation has been taught wrong in thinking that you need to like double click meditation once you're freaked out versus having it being part of your operating system right. so that throughout the day you're like, hey, dude, you got too many windows open. You might want to try closing some down if you want to you know, get stuff done and not freak out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it and it seems like in, in the metaphorical sense, we all have way too many windows open as humans, our brains it, it seems like we can't handle that. And there are, you know, when you actually look at brains, you can see those problems, right? You can, you can see it in an MRI machine. So what is it about meditation that can help that? Well, it's about understanding what you're doing in a given moment so that you can throttle back and just stick to doing one thing Mm -hmm. at a time. So, you know, in in the martial arts, I'm not blocking 16 punches at the same time. I'm going to get punched in the face. I'm blocking the first one, then the second Mm -hmm. one, and then so forth and so forth. And it looks like I just did it all instantly. Mm -hmm. But that to me is um, a hallmark of the illusion of multitasking that we've all fallen for is thinking we could do multiple things at the same time instead of executing on individual items Mm -hmm. uh, effectively and then looking like a master because it looks graceful, right? From the outside perspective, it looks like you're doing them simultaneously, but the master is handling one punch and one block at the same time, one email at a time and Mm -hmm. and so forth. Isn't it great because you ask, uh, professional athletes this or, or professional musicians how did you do that that amazing thing and they're like i don't know <laughs> right because <you're, laughs> totally. your brain doesn't work like that you don't engage the rational part of of what's going on when you're performing at your highest level it's something that comes out of you uh, but it's it's really dependent upon putting in that practice first right so what are some of the things that people can do to incorporate the practice of of mindfulness into whether they're you know lifting weights or driving in LA traffic or writing an email? How can you, you know, combine this ancient world of knowledge with the, the present one of chaos? Yeah, it's a great question. And and really you alluded to it there is everything that you do is an opportunity to do this thing that's kind of the 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 central premise of these Chinese philosophies, which is called cultivation, which is I can sit here and feel sorry for myself that my appointment hasn't showed up and just start getting angry and like, you know, checking Facebook for a hundred fiftieth time today. Mm-hmm. Or I can say, Great, they just gifted me five minutes to catch my breath mm-hmm. and just take a couple breaths and just kind of feel what's happening in my body and check in. And that could happen in the car. I mean, look, so what? Don't don't close your eyes. You could still breathe and be focused and concentrating in the car. You don't have to be in lotus position to meditate. I think a lot of these kind of um, bumpers that have been slapped around this thing makes people say, well, I can't meditate. I'm not wearing Lululemon. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know what I mean? And it's yeah. just, it doesn't make any sense. It's about just catching your breath. And so when you're lifting that weight, either you are sitting there thinking about your bills or talking to your buddy or whatever. Or you're breathing in, you're focusing, and every single cell in your body is is behind one another in the execution of this task, which lines up your energy with your consciousness and the fibers of your muscles. Mm -hmm. So then you become more agile, then you become more connected, and that whole mind-body-spirit connection actually exists. You start talking to professional athletes, and they're all they all start developing this sense of spirituality because they're like, Man, it's 
when I'm in that flow, I just, I feel connected to everything. I could mm -hmm. hear the guy 50 yards down coming my way. I don't have to look. I know where he is. Well, what is that? It just, it opens up your perception because you're stepping in and using your body as frankly, we've used it for hundreds of thousands of years yeah. in, in all of our instincts being tuned in to the present moment. Right now we have a million and one things pulling us out of the present moment mm -hmm. at any given point. And that's, to me, that's the crisis of modernity, right? It's right. the crisis that we live in is our attention is being splintered. Therefore we are just sitting there just, uh, you know, just trying to catch our breath wherever we can. Yeah. <laughs> one of the things I love about hanging out with you, which we've done so many times, but never enough, is that you're really always focusing on recalibrating what stress means today, right? In, in your daily habits, and it's something I love to do too, like racing a mountain bike down a mountain. You can't be thinking about Facebook. You can't be thinking about email. You can't be thinking about anything else because you're about to die if you hit that tree. Same thing if you're skiing and we ski like madmen or you're climbing up and down yes, mountains do. or, or anything like that or especially in, in martial arts. It's a recalibration of stress and you talk about this in your book. So it, it seems like a lot of us are kind of operating at this buzzy higher level of vibration or something where you're all kind of freaked out all the time. What is it about... Uh, about these inherently old school stressful things that snap you back into reality. Yep. Well, you know, stop number one on this is lower abdominal breathing triggers parasympathetic nervous system response. So mm -hmm. either you're in fight or flight or you're in rest or digest, rest and digest, right? And so what that means is I have the pathway to my own kind of ancient circuitry that forces my nervous system to just chill out and work on healing and building and growing muscle and relaxing and, and doing all these wonderful things that I'm supposed to be doing way more often, yet I forgot to do it and I never remember to do it in my busy day because the narrative of the world is that you can rest when you're dead. Mm. The narrative of the world is, you know, weakness is, is, you know, all around you and what you're supposed to do is just work harder than the other guy and frankly, you know, smoke crack, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, everyone is, is smoking crack in some way right whether it's in the form of excess caffeine or pills or you know what whatever it is is we're taking all these substances to really force ourselves right. to go beyond our, our our productive capacity where our bodies are comfortable and then we wonder why our bodies start to fail on us we wonder why the cortisol levels are are making us store fat more than we'd like to and then all of a sudden we're like damn it I go to the gym, I eat that paleo stuff, why am I not losing this weight? Mm -hmm. And no one's willing to look at stress because looking at stress means looking at your world, right? I got this, yeah. I, I do a lot of corporate wellness consulting and it's kind of a it's kind of a crappy gig in some ways because we'll go interview a bunch of people about like what's going on and what's wrong with their company. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the moral of the story is these guys are working their employees too hard. So the guy that's paying you to go in there and find a solution, you gotta go back to and be like, hey, can you chill out? Cause you're killing them. Right. Yeah. And, so, and so then it becomes a negotiation about like, you know, the economy and, and, and how we run. And so look, I can't fix the entire economy right now, but I know how to fix a person mm -hmm. by teaching them how to keep their finger on the dial of that burn rate. Right. Yeah. It's like, you can't burn up and be there for your family five years from now. Right. And there's, there's another element of that too, that is so old school and it's so deeply human. I remember, you know, you brought up <laughs> martial arts when I was doing Krav Maga several times a week, I was never so relaxed as when I was after I got punched in the face, <laughs> I was done. And then I got in my car and drove home through traffic. Everyone's cutting you off, whatever. And you're just like, ah, right. Like in fight club or, or some of those movies, you get punched in the face and you laugh because you're just like, man, I thought all this other stuff was hard and it just snaps you right back in <laughs> to what it means to be human. Right. And yeah, what it and, means and to attacked. be hacked <laughs> and attacked. Yeah, That's actual that, danger. Like yeah, we think that like the cell phone bill that like went over in our bandwidth and like cost us an extra 40 bucks is stress. Um, try having bullets flying at you, right? Mm -hmm. Try having someone punching you in the face. And so I call it recalibrating your stress bucket. And that mm -hmm. could be mountain biking. It could be martial arts. It could be, you know, jumping out of a plane, but something to put perspective back on those survivor genes to be like, oh, oh, right. 
This is how I used to roll. So all that petty nonsense starts to kind of be reframed into just that, right? Yeah. Like a warrior doesn't worry about the small stuff and a warrior really doesn't worry about anything because mm -hmm. they can't afford the luxury of that thought. Yeah, exactly. What, what are some other things that people can do? Because that's the other side of meditation, right? There's meditation where you're like, turning everything off, you're going into yourself. <laughs> then, there's, then there's the more adventurous side, which I think is, is just as useful, but in the opposite way. What are some other things that people can do? Say meditation isn't really something they can do right now or whatever. They're not yep. willing to, because that, that's a big jump, right? Because you have to buy yep. Lululemon, you have to move to LA. <laughs> but what are some you, other... You have, to, you have to start doing yoga and pretend you're better than people. <laughs> <laughs> but what are some things, that, what are some more adventurous things that, that I know you do um, that could help people kind of start out and recalibrate that stress bucket. Yeah. One of the things that's worked really well recently, um, and, and I, you know, I do this for like 2200 companies. So I get, I get a lot of people to practice on yeah. is what I'm having my employees and my students do is every 25 minutes, you have a little thing that beeps, whether it's on your computer or your phone and you take a five minute break. Mm -hmm. And what I like to do is say, you're going to do 10 reps of something whether it's squats, plyos, pull-ups, push-ups, anything, right? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, go stretch out, go for a walk, take a bio break, take a few breaths, come back in. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I've raised that to five sets of 10 reps, right? Nice. So I get 50, so that's 100 of something an hour. So that's 800 reps during your day mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, you know this better than any, even if you work – for your eight hours and you are one of the fortunate few that can make it to the gym um, mm -hmm. if you don't hate it, right? Uh, for an hour, the studies are showing that that still doesn't work off the detrimental effects of sitting on your ass all day, mm -hmm. right? And that means that what you've done effectively is shut down your legs and your circulation. You've shut down the, the energy production capacity of the big muscles in your legs and you've crunched your back and you've crunched your posture and, and, and everything in your life just went wrong, mm -hmm. right? And so instead of that, just refuse to be that still water. Just move throughout the day, do little things all day throughout your day. And man, I'm finding that the people that are doing this they're going for the coffee pot less. Mm -hmm. They're craving sugar less. They're making better food decisions. And uh, scientifically, we know that it brings up your active metabolic rate. Mm -hmm. So that then your resting metabolic rate comes up. Means you start doing this a couple months into it. Not only are you feeling better, your mood is better. You're burning the weight. What happens is when you go home and you are not wiped out, you have the energy to be there for your spouse, for your kids, for your family, for that reading you wanted to do to advance your career or whatever it is. You don't feel like you're washing up on the beach of life mm -hmm. and just hoping that you can make it till Friday, right? It, it's, it's one of the most revolutionary things you can do and all it takes is to just have your watch beep at you and get up and just do something twice an hour. I love it. Now, there is <laughs> that the distance between knowing what to do and actually doing it. I know when I worked in consulting, the running joke was always that we needed to hire ourselves because we were a mess as, as a business, mm. right? Now, mm. for you, when you had, around the time you had your first child, Soul, um, life kind of got ahead of you too and you started carrying some extra weight. There was too much stress. You weren't sleeping well. You kind of fell apart. So what happened there and what did you do to get back on track? Yeah, great question. And I, I want to put it, put it to you that I have never met a health guru that doesn't have a story like this, but I have seldom met a health guru that tells a story like this. Right. So yes. yeah, let's, let's be human. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, you know, was running everything according to plan. Oh yeah. And then, you know, we're gonna have this kid and that kind of like drops in on the calendar and being a guy who's never had a kid, you don't realize what a hurricane class five can do to your town. Right. <laughs> and so all of a sudden everything, like I'm in the middle of a movie launch, I got all sorts of crap going on. We got this kid, you know, I'm over here, you know, running. A, uh, a, um, I did not throttle back on my work life mm -hmm. at all. And what happened, which had never happened before in my life, because I'm a great sleeper, is I had this, you know, this crying child waking us up mm -hmm. multiple times a night. And so at first it was like, okay, whatever, whatever. And it just kept going and it kept going. And, you know, two, three months into it, I'm like, why is this guy getting fat? Right. 
And, and all of a sudden I started running out of the steam that I had taken for granted mm -hmm. because I had now spent two, three months not sleeping. And it just, it occurred to me, man, I was like, holy crap, this is the beginning of the end for a lot of people. Right. Because you don't they come start back from not that. feeling yeah, you don't come back. Like mm -hmm. all of a sudden you're like, well, you know, the show must go on. Oh, here's the second kid. Here's the third kid. You know, uh, I had, you know, something happened at work. We went through a divorce. And like that's where pharmaceuticals start to show up and smile, right? Mm -hmm. It's just like I know you don't have time to deal with this, so just take this pill, right? And then we start taking that slippery slope down to reliance on drugs and not ever feeling like we used to. Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, you know, you can only have wisdom on the other side of a real life experience, right? So here I am, I'd study with the Dalai Lama, I'd done all these things, I'm a doctor, I've done all this like cool stuff in my life, I know the answers, right? But then life walks up and punches you in the face and you're like, oh, damn, yeah, wow, I am a lot more sympathetic towards parents now. Mm -hmm. And so now I owe it to my family, myself and my world to figure this out. So then I uh, started looking at everything I needed to do to work my life in a way where I you know, kind of brought things back online and it, you know, it didn't take long, but it took kind of waking up to the fact that you can't keep running your life the same way, mm -hmm. expecting similar results when circumstances have changed. Right. right. And so that's just, you know, I started hacking my sleep and really working on uh, light, dark cycles, keeping it cooler, working on getting the kid to sleep and, you know, now the kids, <laughs> you know, and, and, and all the things that, um, go into, um, basically taking a proactive position on making sure that this thing, it's like having a leak in your plumbing and it's like, Oh, I'm just going to go to sleep. It's like, no, your house is going to flood. Right. Like you've got to get up and fix that leak. Yeah. But get your sleep too. <laughs> well, yeah. Or no, or lose a couple nights of sleep to yeah. fix the leak right? so that then you could sleep in perpetuity or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. you just, you have to address it. And, you know, if not, it's just going to it's just going to flood you out. You're just going to have more problems in life. And you have a unique strategy for this that a lot of people don't uh, employ themselves, which is kind of like a winter hibernation. Can you talk about that? How you how you actually focus on catching up on sleep long term? Oh, yeah. This is uh, today is actually my last day of the year um, as we're recording this uh, to before I go down. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, I basically am going to spend the next two weeks just cuddling up with my family and getting sleep at every turn. Mm -hmm. And don't apologize for being lazy in the winter. Don't feel like you are an unproductive wretch for taking that extra time. Because if you look at it, I mean, we've gotten it all wrong, man. The holidays now are about running around fighting people for parking spots at the mall going to stupid you know red sweater parties spending and like money you don't have on crap you don't need spending money you don't have on crap you don't need making sure the bankers are still rich and mm -hmm. you know making sure that china keeps putting mercury in the in, in the environment and all the just all the <laughs> bs that you know we're doing in honor of jesus's birthday you know and it's just it's amazing to me how much crap we put ourselves through and how exhausted we are at the end of the year mm -hmm. for what mm -hmm. during hibernation time during the the very time that we are biologically programmed to chill the hell out catch our breath let ourselves just kind of like restore and repair so that we can enter into the following spring with some energy yeah. So I, you know, this is a very Taoist practice. And for me, it's worked uh, incredibly well. And for thousands of my students is just have a culture around hibernation and relaxation, hang out by candlelight, spend more time in the dark, uh, stop watching TV at night. This is a time to, you know, have a fire and some candles and read a book and just hole in, right? And, you know, get those warm blankets and just spend that time with your loved ones mm -hmm. in a much less hectic way. And I promise you, you'll know in the spring how good that was for you, right? Yeah. You know, people will find a, like a spring in their step a couple months later and go, oh my God, I, you know, wow, all I needed to do was do what my body asked me to do instead mm -hmm. of just taking the double espresso because my body was complaining and screw that, right? Mm -hmm. We don't listen. You know, we don't listen to the signals and we'll just caffeinate or get drunk or something and just push through instead of being like, hey, my body's tired. Yeah. It has every right to be tired. It's been a long year. Right. Well, and we've, we've trained ourselves for that or we've been trained in that regard, haven't we? Uh, we've talked about this offline 
before about you, uh, especially type A personalities, right? You uh, you go to the best school you possibly can in order to get there. You have to do all these extracurricular activities. You have to sacrifice sleep. You have to sacrifice friendships. You have to sacrifice relationships. Um, you get there. You keep going. Then you get a job, and you have to work really hard. And then your vacation as you learned in college, is going and drinking as much as you possibly can through <laughs> the wee hours of the night, maybe sleeping a little bit during the days when you're hungover, and then filling up those days, especially if you're on vacation, with event after event to take photos of whatever in Paris and Tokyo. You're going all around, and you're never really stopping to catch your breath, to find your center, and to really look toward the future as a whole person again. So how do you how do you get that out of your head? How do you get that out of your habits when it's been indoctrinated in us for so long? Yeah. Well, you know, it's, if you, if you never go to Paris, it's also a shame, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's a time and a place for everything. And so take the time when you're tired to catch your breath. And then when the sun is, you know, when the sun is out, make hay, right? Mm -hmm. And so, look, I, I love life. I love traveling. I love, you know, a good party and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, there's a time and a place for it. So if you find yourself exhausted taking a 14-city tour of Paris or, or of, of Europe mm -hmm. is not – probably not the answer, right? Mm -hmm. That's where, you know, the Bahamas come in. That's where a camping trip comes in or a staycation comes in. Having that kind of dedicated, allocated time to just chill out and recover. Yeah. Once you've given yourself that, then, you know, the world's your oyster, right? But I, you know, I agree. Like I hate tourism in that way, right? Like I love experiencing places. I love, you know, kind of walking the streets and just kind of feeling the, the time signature of the place that I'm at. Mm -hmm. Because even as we travel, especially Americans, we carry our own unique, crazy time signature. And so we, we take that, we like infect the time of the places we go into yeah. instead of allowing the time there to resonate into ourselves so that we can feel the different vibration of the land and the people that we're visiting. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I, th I think hacking time is a really important uh, place uh, in our lives that we've lost. And time is one of our most incredibly valuable allies once we learn how to breathe into it and stop and modulate time. I think mm -hmm. we're all just caught on crazy time and we don't know how to slow it down. And that kind of goes back to what we, you know, start talking about, which is meditation, mm -hmm. which is one of our really uh, amazing tools that have, co that have come down for thousands of years in helping us turn that dial and just get out of fifth gear, right? Like yeah. we have other gears and meditation is really about learning how to pop into pop in that clutch and find the different gears of our consciousness and understand that it's not all go 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 mm -hmm. and once we get that then it really enriches the the kind of the breadth of who we are and who we can be with other people and who we can get along with and how we can spend our time in a way that nourishes us instead of just annihilates us yeah. if we're not either laid up or doing that thing we need to be doing right now to go back on your your earlier experience that you shared about um, getting ahead of yourself, losing that sleep, you were able to lose fat during that process too, right? And I remember we talked about this. I was like, so what did you do? And you said, just kind of like, you were very curt about it. You're like, oh, it wasn't hard. You know, I should have known this all along. I should have done it. So what, what were the little hacks that, that you started doing in your own dietary habits around that time? So you know what happened was you start robbing Peter to pay Paul, mm -hmm. right? So once you're tired, then you start justifying. It's like, look, I got, you know, I have a big life. I'm on, you know, I do TV and film and all this kind of crap. So it's like, mm -hmm. I got to be up. Right. And so all of a sudden you start rationalizing that, that cup of coffee in the morning. And I wasn't mm -hmm. a coffee guy. I didn't really drink coffee until my first kid. I remember sudden, when you first started. Yeah. Yeah. And this thing showed up that, that changed my life. And all of a sudden I added this chemical that was, really helping in the mm -hmm. short term, right? Mm -hmm. It was like a high interest credit card that someone gives you when you're in college, right? You're like for a slinky. You're like, damn, this is great. You know, I get to go, you know, buy beer. They just give it to me. And, and then the bill comes, right? And so I started kind of using coffee to kind of, you know, say, okay, this is temporary. But what I didn't realize, and I knew better, right? But, I, you know, you're too tired and stumbling mm -hmm. to kind of get it, is that then that coffee started skewing my adrenals and my blood sugar. And then I started craving 
sugars and carbs more. Mm -hmm. And so then I look back over the last couple of months going, dude, why am I eating way more carbs than I used to? Right? So it changed the profile of the fuel that I was consuming by, by the nature of kind of spiking up that cortisol and kind of driving you into your day. Mm -hmm. And then once I realized that I was like, Oh, 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 this is, this is bad. Right. I yeah. know better than this. Right. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, you know, and it, and it took me a couple months to wake up to it. So, you know, shame on me, I guess. But, you know, then immediately what I started doing is I cut out the carbs. You crave them for a couple days. Right. Mm -hmm. But just more protein and fat pulled off the coffee, started doing some green tea. And within a week or so, I just kind of like throttle back on all caffeine and then boom weight started dropping off i start feeling like exercising again mm -hmm. i was getting the same little sleep but i was able to sustain my lifestyle and like you know get back into the gym get on a squat rack start moving some heavier weights mm -hmm. and then building up kind of the natural energy production capacity of this body that's so good at it right mm -hmm. that just forgot because I, you know, fell asleep to it. Right. And I'm not, you know, my body's no different than anyone else's. Right. Sure. It's just, we're really good at producing energy and producing fuel in the right way. And what happens is we get into the Western traditional diet and we get into the stagnant lifestyle mm -hmm. and we start, uh, self-medicating with stimulants like coffee. And it, it really skews the math. It really throws us off. And, you know, here I am a guy that teaches this stuff going, uh Oh, you know, I, I probably put on about 15 pounds mm -hmm. and, you know, I tell you, it goes on faster than it comes off, but yeah. you know, it started coming off pretty quickly once I realized that the coffee was the Trojan horse that got, you know, kind of got in within the city walls mm -hmm. and that started changing behavior in diet and exercise and inflammation. You know, it's like, it's harder to exercise when your body hurts and like, mm -hmm. you know, all my old martial arts injuries start coming back. I was like, what the hell is this? Yeah. Oh, oh, wow. That was quick, right. right? It happens very quickly. And isn't it fascinating when that, that just one little thing starts to turn all these other knobs without you realizing it, and then you start following the wrong signals, right? So what was it about coffee? Because I think this is fascinating. Some people can kind of get away with it a little, a little bit if you do it in a, in a conscious way and you're not drinking a pot a day, you're not drinking it at the wrong times. Is this something where you think you won't be a coffee drinker forever you're going to go for the the green teas or the herbal tonics or like what do you recommend what's what's the way forward because that was the thing that set off a lot of problems yeah um for me it was much more um understanding what it is as a medicine it's mm -hmm. like you know tylenol is great when you need it um only take it when you really need it right? right and so i'll have a cup of coffee now and again i'm okay with it right i just don't want to be in a cup of coffee a day type of lifestyle ever. Right. 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 And so it's the same thing with alcohol. I just finished a gong, which is a hundred day practice I do where I did no grains, no added sugar, no alcohol for a hundred days. Fine. You know, and I, I felt great and I had all sorts of stuff going for me. And I was like, mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, I'm not an alcoholic. I don't have party problems. So like I added alcohol back on the list. I'm still doing no grains, and no, no added sugar, mm -hmm. but like whatever I go to, a, I go to a party, I'll have a drink or two. It's like, when the hell do I get out? Yeah. Right. And so like, <laughs> I keep it, I keep it in my life. Um, because it, it's, not disruptive. So I would, I would say the same thing with that, right? Is it's like a gun, you know, you got to be careful with it. But mm -hmm. if you understand, you know, what a gun is, then you, you know, lock it up and you keep it for self-defense or you use it for hunting and stuff. But it's a serious, like it's an adult toy, right? Mm -hmm. And so coffee is the same thing. Like you better know what you're doing. Like, you know, you could swipe something on your credit card, but you better know that you will have the money to pay it the following month. Yeah. Or have like a, a plan to pay it back. If you're just swiping money on credit card, not knowing where the, you know, the, the next kind of paycheck is coming from, that's, I think, where a lot of people get into energy debt slavery with coffee. Yeah. Right. And you just don't know when you're going to catch your breath and then you're in big trouble. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things, and I think a lot of people suffer from that problem, but one of the things I like about your book is all these little vign vignettes. What's one that that you want to share right now? What's, you know, someone walks into Pedram's office, the typical person suffering from all the things they're suffering from today. And what do you do with them? What do you, what's your advice? How do you turn this stuff around? Cause a lot of people, I think they're just drowning, right? They think there's no hope. So you might as well just keep leaning into it, keep pushing forward, but there's a better way. 
Yep. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the kind of common themes in uh, kind of clinical practice for me was people come in spinning like a cyclone, right? Mm -hmm. I got this and I got that and I went to Dr. So-and-so and and like usually I'm kind of like an end of the line guy where they've seen every expert in the world and they're like, help me, Obi-Wan, you're my only hope. And I'm Mm -hmm. just like, great, no no, no pressure here, right? Yeah. And usually the answer lies in simplicity, not further complexity, right? Mm. So what that means is I'll say, well, you know, you say you want to exercise. Um, let me see your phone. And be like, well, I don't, I don't see any exercise booked onto your calendar here. Mm-hmm. And be like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, you've booked everything else into your life, right. but where's your exercise? And they say, oh, you know, I, you know, I try to get to it after work. I say, well, how, you know, when's the last time you went to the gym? And they're like, oh, Right. And so we're terrible at making and keeping appointments with ourselves. Right. And then we complain about our self care falling apart. But like the guys want to go get a drink or there's a new movie out, you'll wait in line. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and so being able to use our calendar to put in what it is that we have said we want for ourselves is really important because what happens is when most people get to me, they've broken so many promises to themselves. Mm-hmm that every single thing that they say they want to commit to ends up being something that proves to them further that they're a failure Mm -hmm. because they also don't follow through with that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really kind of created a a, a gap between their intention and their, their word. And so what we start working on is just getting your word back, you know, honoring your word and saying, look, if you said that you want to go to the gym, then let's book an appointment to make you go to the gym for that half hour a day during lunch. And that's just what you do. Mm -hmm. And here's the really important piece to that, that most people are terrible at, which is when something else shows up around that gym time that starts to want to crowd in, there's a word in your arsenal that you need to get used to using. It's a two letter word and it's spelled Mm N-O, right? Mm -hmm. No, If you have said yes to something, whether it's your exercise, your family, your personal care, your meditation, and you've said yes to this, like I'm doing this, that means when something wants to crowd into that space, you must say no so that you can say, continue to say yes to the thing that you've elected. And I think we've become so terrible at saying no that we just layer stuff on and we're like, I don't know, just I got overwhelmed. And it's like, well... (laughs) Did you have to get in the car and drive to Disneyland? Yeah. Did they did they take you at gunpoint? Mm-hmm. No, you just got excited and you said yes, and then you forgot that you were supposed to spend time with your kid that day, or, mm-hmm. or that's a terrible example because you're taking your kid to Disneyland, mm-hmm. but you know your your wife that day. Mm-hmm. So those types of things are really important. And then what I find really is just let's look at the phthalates, let's look at the BPA, let's look at all the garbage in the environment yeah. that's crowding out your cells, your physiology and your endocrine system that's making you fat and unable to think clearly. And let's go back to real food, which, you know, you and I, you know, could talk about for hours. Yeah. And, and what, when's the last time you're out in the sun? You know, let's get outside, let's get moving, let's eat food that came from the earth and let's start simplifying our commitments and realize that you're not going to build the Eiffel Tower in a week. But, if you really want to build an Eiffel Tower, you can dedicate the next 10 years of your life to it and get it done. Mm-hmm. So what are you doing today? What are you doing in the next 30 days to get there, mm-hmm. right? And so just really slowing down because you can do a lot in life. And for those who know me, I mean, I do a lot. You know, I'm making multiple movies. I got TV shows. I got books. Like mm-hmm. I'm a busy dude, but I'm never ever the guy that's like panicking or stressed out because I'm still just doing one thing at a time. And I'm doing what it is that I set out to do. And when those things are done, I move on to the next thing. Mm-hmm. And that's how you have to do it. Now, you mentioned your gong earlier, which is uh, for people who don't realize, basically a commitment to yourself for a defined period of time, which is a great way to do it because it's hard to make change when you're just like, I'm going to start doing this thing forever, I guess. <laughs> that doesn't yep. usually work for people. <laughs> but you mentioned... Um, Fasting from grains, avoiding grains, which surprises a lot of people at first. It's actually a very ancient practice um, to get away from the the grain demons, right? Can you talk a little bit about yep. that um, and, and, and your thinking behind why would you ditch grains for that period of time? Yep. So if you look at what grains are and you look at the husk around the seed, which is where we pull most of the kind of like the matter for for the grains and we mill it, um, that stuff specifically is what the plant 
has biologically developed and evolved to surround the seed so that animals don't eat it. Mm -hmm. It's saying, stop, go away, don't eat me. In, in a small dose, it's fine. We're big, big, dumb animals. We could handle it, right? But what it does is it slows down our digestion and it cuts enzymatic activity. Mm -hmm. So now take those grains and then mill them and refine them and eat them day in and day out. And you wonder why you can't poop. Mm -hmm. You wonder why the inflammatory origins of the body start in the gut. You wonder why your joints are aching and every time you run, it hurts so you can't do it. And so the thinking for this for me is I don't need, like I'm not running marathons, right? You want to eat some pasta and run a marathon, you know, that's your business, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm not running marathons right now. I'm doing more kind of like in gym lifting and, you know, just stuff around town. I don't need those types of, of kind of carbohydrate calories. And I don't know very many people who do, mm -hmm. right? Very, very, very few people, you know, who are like super skinny can like really get away with that. Most of us are just building inflammation and uh, putting on fat. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's a whole, like it's called Hua Gu syndrome. There's a whole thing in Chinese medicine around kind of cursing people by cursing their grains. And you look at some of the, the original stories, uh, you know, uh, you know, and this is obviously kind of a, a funny theory, but arguably one of the first uh, examples of biological terrorism and, and kind of uh, uh, sabotage is Moses – uh, poisoning the grain silos of the Egyptians and giving them all ergot poisoning. Because if you look at it, the mm -hmm. eldest sons all got ergot poisoning, which is kind of, you know, moldy grain. Mm -hmm. And what that is, is it puts them into hallucination because it's kind of like LSD and it makes them go crazy. And a lot of them got really sick. And so, you know, there's all sorts of interesting stories about poisoning grain silos and how easy it is for grains to go rancid and get uh, messed up with, with mold. And, you know, that's just, you know, outside of the kind of original uh, physiology, biology of the husk, which already slows down your metabolism and your enzymatic activity. So mm -hmm. it's just, look, if the plant says don't eat me and you keep eating more and more of it and you wonder why you don't feel well, yeah. you know, it's just one of those things that it's just kind of like, what are we doing in our culture? Right? right. And so I just do better without grains. Mm -hmm. And for anyone who's listening to this, that's like, well, that, that sounds crazy. Don't say I'm going to just stop eating grains for the rest of my life. Just pick a time, like what you what you had just alluded to earlier. Forever is a very long time, mm -hmm. but you could do anything for thirty days or a hundred days. Mm -hmm. So just try it, and if you find that you feel better, hey, you know that's that's just that's profit. That's just you know it's just a bonus for you. Yeah. So for you, when you took the grains out, what did you replace it with? What did you eat more of? I started eating more vegetables, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'm not like paleo uh, exclusive in that way where I think legumes are great. Mm -hmm. I, I think like, you know, soaking lentils and cooking them uh, does really well. I think lentils are a great vegetarian protein source. Mm -hmm. I'll eat kind of, you know, grass fed pastured meats and stuff and, and fish. Um, but I just upped my vegetables. I 3X'd my vegetables and started taking some more lentils and, and, and legumes that I tolerated well. Um, plenty of coconut oil, right? I'm not a dairy guy. And mm -hmm. then, and then lean meats. Mm -hmm. It's fine. Yeah. I was not hungry. I was not moody. I didn't need caffeine. I mean, this is still the case. I'm that guy now, right? Yeah. I don't need caffeine to get through my days. And mind you, by the way, here's round two. I had a baby a month ago yeah. and I'm fine. Right. Yeah. And, and so, you know, it's, it, it's all the proofs in the pudding. And so if you take out the grains and you kind of take it easy on, on the, the stimulants and you just start using big muscles and moving throughout the day and learn to calm your mind, it turns out that it doesn't take as much energy being you mm -hmm. and you can reinvest that energy in your dreams and your aspirations and all the good stuff in life that we always complain about not having time to get to. Yeah, I love it. Speaking of, we're just about out of time, but before we go, please tell folks about your new book, your podcast, all the other fun stuff you're working on. Cool, man. Yeah, this this book I'm really proud of. It's um, I get to speak um, like I speak, you know, so I cuss and do whatever I want to do because I'm just <laughs> that a potty guy. mouth for a monk, potty mouth, urban monk. Right. <laughs> and and so it's all about real life things like diet and sleep and exercise and all sorts of like really important hacks and Eastern wisdom that mm -hmm. I've found actually works for thousands of patients over the years. And so the book is is really kind of a how to it's the kind of book that you're going to carry around and write in and and use for years to come on um, people who've uh, read the book 
and reviewed it. Love it. It's yeah. actually it's 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 uh, it's something I'm very proud of. So it's called The Urban Monk. Um, you can get it at theurbanmonk.com or anywhere books are sold, bookstores and all that. And um, you know you can also find the podcast called The Urban Monk uh, there. Um, I also host a podcast called The Health Bridge, and I'm the founder of Well.org. So I do I do a lot of stuff, um, and um, I take the time to do the stuff that I do well. And the urban monk is something that I'm really, really happy with. And it's something that just, it it feels good because it's honest and it's not this like LA poser guru vibe. It's just, it's just a real honest look at how we can just live a healthy life without having to, you know, get weird, right? Like we could just not have to stress out. Yeah. The Urban Monk, it's a great book. It's packed also with exercises, very simple ones that you can build into your day-to-day life. Can we leave folks out there who are listening with with something simple they can do to just turn down the noise a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that I love uh, getting into the day is you start feeling the noise boot up. And mostly you could just kind of feel it with your, your shoulders starting to rise, mm-hmm. right? So that's the time that you just get out, like stand up real quick and then just shake your body. Just inhale and then exhale, shake. Let your whole body shake out. Yeah. And if you're watching the video, Abel's doing it right now too, is you just shake out the whole body as you exhale and then inhale and just shake. And you do that for like two minutes and you're like, wow, all right, yeah, cool. And it's just like, it's like, you know, if, if your dog were to, and we both have Labradors, if your dog were to jump into a lake, they get out and they shake off all the water. Mm-hmm. And it's just like this pure movement where all of a sudden they're like dry, right? Yeah. Think of it the same way with stress. It's just like inhale and then exhale and shake all the stress off. And literally within a minute or two, maximum two minutes of this you're just like whoop all right yeah i'm back like a, you back in, in your, your book what was it like a gazelle after they're they're chased and they somehow made it they kind of kick out and shake it out it's actually very beneficial to the nervous system yeah it's it's actually where the adrenals reset and basically flood out all of the adrenaline and you know the cortisol and it kind of resets and recalibrates that stress bucket so that they can go back to eating right we don't do that so that we carry that stress around all day and we come home and we'll like snap at you know the dog for like wanting to go for a walk and we yeah. you know that's our <laughs> lives and so you know we should shake it out more often and be there for our families and you know just be cool yeah i love it well Pedram Shojai is his name. The name of the book and the podcast is The Urban Monk. Please check it out. Pedram, always a pleasure, man. Thanks so much for coming on. Great to see you, Abel. Thank you. Do you want to know how we saved more than 300 bucks on our grocery bill last month? If you've ever wondered, how can I feed my family real food on a budget? What cuts of meat are the best value? Which brand of almond flour works best for baking? What's the best coconut oil to use? Where can I buy locally raised beef and poultry for half price? Well, we just created a handy dandy guide to help you save time and money on your grocery bill so you can get your family the highest quality real food they deserve on any budget. In this guide, you'll learn how to save time by knowing exactly where, when, and how to shop for your favorite foods, snacks, and treats, which brands of supplements, protein, and ingredients we trust, recommend, and use at home, money-saving shopping hacks that will cut your grocery budget by 30%, 50%, or even more while enjoying the best quality meats, seafood, and fresh organic produce, how to reduce food waste in your kitchen to stretch your food dollar farther than you ever thought possible, and much more. And since we just launched the shopping guide, you can get a discount to grab it for less than 10 bucks. All you have to do is type in from any device, fatburningman.com slash shopping. That's fatburningman.com slash shopping. See you there. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Fat Burning Man. If you liked it, Don't forget to hit the subscribe button on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, the podcast app, or wherever else you might be listening to or watching this show. Got a second? Please leave me a quick review on iTunes. I always love hearing from you. And if you think someone else might like and benefit from this free show, please take a second to share it with a friend or with a family member. You can get in touch with me on Twitter at FatBurnMan. And Facebook by typing in Abel James or Fat Burning Man. Drop me a line anytime. Did you know that I've recorded over 150 episodes of Fat Burning Man, winning four awards in independent media and hitting number one in more than eight countries? And here's some more good news. You can download and listen to every single episode for free. All you have to do is type in 
fatburningman.com. I'll give you a second to type it in, fatburningman.com. And you'll get all the show notes and video and audio versions for all the past episodes of Fat Burning Man. Better yet, enter your best email at fatburningman.com, sign up for my newsletter, and I'll even send you a quick start guide to start burning fat right now and a few of our ridiculously tasty recipes as a special thanks for signing up. Once again, just go to fatburningman.com right now, enter your best email to get your free fat burning download straight to your inbox and make sure that you never miss a show again. This is Abel James signing off. Thanks so much for listening and have a great week. This is my way of life from now on. You know, I've got my kids eating it, my granddaughter's yes. eating it, you know. I mean, this is the, this is the way our family lives. So, I mean, yeah. you you can come over anytime look at my pantry. There is nothing possible except for some of the baby food yeah. in my pantry. It's all fresh. Yeah.